welcome back. And today we're working on the UE1, my homebrew DIY vacuum tube computer. Not to be confused with the Bendix G15, a legitimate vacuum tube computer from the 1950s that we are also working on. But the UE1 here is very heavily based on the Motorola MC14500. This is a little one-bit industrial control unit integrated circuit that Motorola developed in the 70s. And it was designed to replace relay ladder logic in industrial situations. Um, one example that they outline in the manual is a traffic light controller, and that's something that it's really well suited for. But we took that design and we modified it slightly to give it a proper arithmetic logic unit instead of just a logic unit. So this machine is a one-bit microprocessor that can do addition, subtraction, and various other logic operations. But it can't really do much more than that. It doesn't store any programs in it. It doesn't execute anything. It has to all be done via remote control. So I want to finish out the rest of the system. And we had a design that we were kind of running down and I just didn't like the way that one was going. So we scrapped that idea and we took yet another page out of Motorola's handbook. In that handbook, they outlined the minimal ICU system which I've actually built before onto uh, this little uh, single board computer right here. This is the Motorola minimal ICU system outlined in the MC14500 handbook. It's just put onto a single PCB with some pretty hilarious design requirements by me that made it so huge. But I think this thing turned out absolutely fantastic. And so we're gonna build this out of vacuum tubes. Now the uh, UE14500, the processor portion of it, is massive, takes up a ton of space, and it's pretty much just this single IC right here, which means that everything else on this board needs to fit in the same footprint as one of these. So essentially I'm trying to keep this thing down to just two boards. And that sounds like an impossibility, but I think we can get there with some pretty tricky stuff like a paper tape. So let's hop over to the bench, take a look at uh, where we are, where we're going, how we're gonna get there, and then we'll build up some more boards today and uh, see if we can get them going. So let's hop over there and get started. All right, let's start with a quick review of the uh, minimal ICU system. We have that sitting right here in front of us. This uh, single PCB and this diagram over here are actually the same thing. Uh, right in the middle of this diagram, we have the Motorola MC14500, the heart of the entire system, and that is this ICE sitting right here. We've actually built up the equivalent of this with the UE14500 that's over there hanging on the wall, uh, but that means that we we now have to fit everything else on this PCB or, you know, outlined here in this uh, block diagram into the same footprint as the uh, UE14500 because I want to keep it down to two boards. And this highlights two things. The first is that Oof, we got a <laughs> we got a serious mountain to climb, uh, and the second thing is is that uh, this little MC14500 is fantastically complex. I actually had one of these decapped by uh, John McMaster, and then he took uh, high resolution shots of the silicon die and sent those over to Ken Sharif. And Ken worked with me and reverse engineered it and taught me what I was looking at. So Ken has a fantastic article about this particular IC over on his website. Uh, so go check that out if you want to know more about the MC14500. And Ken, if you're watching, thank you so much for that. That was just absolutely awesome. Uh, but what we learned from that is that uh, this MC14500 has a ton of transistors in it. I think Ken estimated about 500, which when compared to other microprocessors of the era is incredibly low, but when compared to the other ICs on this board is massive. Uh, something like uh, one of these 7400 series ICs is gonna have just a small fraction of that number, except for this big ROM up here. That is, impossible. We cannot recreate this out of vacuum tubes. So instead, we're going to recreate that out of paper tape. 
Uh, the paper tape is just eight bits wide and it just so happens this ROM puts out eight bits and our instruction word is eight bits. Everything kind of lined up perfectly there. And if we look back at the block diagram here, that pretty much eliminates the top two thirds of this block diagram. All that's left is the system inputs, the system outputs, and the scratch bits. And we actually did some work on those in the previous episodes. Uh, but what I want to build today is the paper tape interface. That small sliver of stuff that's not shown on any of these uh, that connects the paper tape itself to the rest of the machine. And so let's take a look at how we're doing that with this diagram right here. This is my diagram for the entire system, everything that we're planning on building. The top half here is the UE14500, that's the processor. The bottom half here is the output register, the scratch register, and the input register. The input register is read only, so that's gonna be these little toggle switches down here on the very bottom. But I said I wanted to work on the paper tape interface and none of that is shown here. And actually the clock isn't even shown here either because the Logisim doesn't handle my two-phase clock all that well. And well, since Logisim can't do that very easily, I have it set up as just two little toggle switches. So I want to build something that uh, takes the eight bits from our paper tape and toggles the clock as well as supplies those eight bits to the rest of the system. And those eight bits are represented on this logic diagram by this little bit up here in the top left. So here's what we're going to build. On the far left here, we have our eight bits coming from our paper tape. These are going to be inverted and buffered. The inverter What do you want, Sue? <laughs> Sorry, this little guy was scratching at the door. I'm gonna have to turn the cameras off and play with the cat for a little bit. <laughs> hey, Sue. Hey, kitty. All right, the cat has been sufficiently appeased, uh, so <laughs> let's pick up where we left off. Uh, we have our eight bits of input coming in. They go through some inverters to clean them up, and then they go through some buffers to feed them to the rest of the system. And then we take all eight of those inputs and feed them into a single NOR gate. Uh, and then the output of this NOR gate goes into our delay for the clock. So what this means is that any single input coming in through any one of the paper tape is going to set off the clock. So we don't have to have a separate clock in the system. We don't have to worry about synchronizing anything everything is synchronized off of the paper tape because the paper tape is the clock the only thing though is that if our input is all zeros it doesn't actually toggle the clock so that's as if though it doesn't exist but the uh, 000 opcode was a no instruction opcode anyways and while we do have a NOP0 flag that we could have used for something else we aren't actually using it for anything. So I think this is an acceptable sacrifice in order to simplify the entire clocking of the system. Uh, so in order to delay that, we're gonna use a little RC circuit, which Logisim doesn't show, so I've just got delay written down here on the bottom. And then we uh, clean up that signal coming out of that RC circuit with a little inverter, and then we send it off to clock the entire system. So this is what we're going to build. But before we get all the way to building it, I wanna test out the clock delay down here because this is a pretty tricky thing. Essentially what I wanna have happen is I want the clock of the entire machine to lag a little bit behind the eight bits coming in. So that way our instruction and our address can settle before we hit the clock to execute whatever that address and instruction is. But honestly, I think we're gonna be running the system at such a low clock speed that it's not gonna be a problem at all. This is probably a little bit of an overkill solution. 
Uh, the maximum speed that I want to run this thing at is 45.5 instructions per second. Uh, that just means that if we can tie one of the output pins directly into a teletype, we can bit bang hello world onto a teletype, which I think would be an awesome demonstration. There are, of course, paper tape systems out there that can go much faster, but none of them have been built by me, the hack. So we'll see how all that comes together. But that's big future stuff. What I want to test out is the clock. So I've built up a little breadboard here to give that a test. But before we put power into this, let's take a look at what exactly it is that I have built. Since the paper tape interface itself hasn't been built, I needed to simulate a signal coming in from that. So that's what this 12AU7 over here on the left is. This is just an A-stable multivibrator and it's just pumping out a square wave. Now we take that square wave and we run it into an inverter. This is that first inverter that's going to uh, clean up the signal coming from the paper tape. Then we take the signal out of that inverter and run it into a cathode follower buffer to make it nice and strong for the rest of the system. Then the output of that cathode follower buffer for the clock, it's going to go through a potentiometer and a 47 nanofarad uh, capacitor. This is creating a little RC delay circuit that's going to add a bit of a slope to the input of the next inverter here. And so that inverter is taking our kind of sloped input and uh, turning it back into a clean square wave. Now the potentiometer, by adjusting it, we change what the RC delay is, change essentially the uh, severity of that slope, which changes how long it takes before the inverter starts to fire and kick off. And then we take the output out of that inverter, send it into another inverter to make sure that we have a properly clean square wave coming out, and this is our delayed clock. Fairly simple, just lots of signal restoration going on. So let's pull an oscilloscope out and pull out a power supply, get some power into this and give it a test and see if we actually are getting the type of delay that we're looking for. All right, it's been a while since I've had my uh, HP 150A oscilloscope out. This is an all vacuum tube oscilloscope and I absolutely adore it, even if it does have its problems. Uh, the biggest problem of which is that it weighs so much it nearly throws my back out every time I pick it up. But uh, I figured we'd use it for this one since we're doing vacuum tube stuff and I'm always looking for an excuse to use this guy. So we've got it out and on and I've got my uh, little breadboard here spun up. So let's take a look at the output of the uh, A-stable multivibrator, that little 12AU7. And so if we take a look at the output of it, uh, we can see this is kind of what the output looks like. Not super clean coming out of uh, that 12AU7 there. That's to be expected with the way that I built that A-stable multivibrator. This is why we send it into a sing signal restoration stage of the uh, 6AU6 here. And the output of that is going to look like this. Uh, now that's not perfect, but it's a lot better. That's a pretty decent looking square wave and that'll actually be good enough to run the system. I have pretty uh, wild margins on that thing. So we take that output, send it through a cathode follower buffer, and then we send it into that little RC circuit that creates a delay. And if we take a look at that, that is our RC delay. You can see that there's a, a really wild looking uh, slope going on there. And so that slope is going to affect uh, how late the input of the next inverter stage happens. And if we take a look at the output of that inverter stage, it looks like this. And really this is less than ideal. This is because of that slope. So we want to take this, send it through one more inverter stage to really give us a good signal restoration. And that's what this looks like. So we have a brilliant square wave coming out of the other side. Uh, now I've got the second scope probe hooked up onto B for that. So if I switch over to chopped, we can see that scope probe there. Now my trigger's upset because it wants to trigger off of uh, A. So we'll go ahead and hook A up to the output of our 12AU7 uh, first inverter stage there. And there we go. So we can see that uh, this kind of overlapping one on the left here, if we look at A only, this is the output of our 12AU7 after its first signal restoration stage. We can see that there is indeed a little bit of a delay there. And if I adjust this little potentiometer here, 
I can slowly adjust that delay. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger there. And if I go the opposite direction, it's gonna get tighter and tighter and tighter. So there we go. It uh, looks like about a one millisecond delay. I've got it set to 0.5 milliseconds per division and it looks like about two divisions between there. Um, so I think that's gonna work fine. One millisecond should be enough time for the instruction word to stabilize before the clock kicks off and does all of its stuff, computing stuff from there. Uh, so the next step is to uh, build this onto PCBs so that we can then mount that to our backing board. And I have a design for these that uh, I'm quite happy with. So I'm gonna fire up the mill and I'm gonna cut those out. They're pretty long PCBs, so it's gonna take a little bit of time to cut this one out, but uh, looking at it, boy, that, man, that one cut really well. I've, I think, finally got my uh, method for cutting PCBs out dialed in because this one came out really beautifully. Uh, of course, though, a blank PCB doesn't do us any good, so I've got to solder all of the components onto this, and there are a lot of components. This is 16 vacuum tubes with seven pins each. Each pin has its own individual one millimeter PCB header that it plugs into, so that's a lot of headers that I've got to solder in. And then, of course, there's the jumpers and then all of the passes. But once we've got everything all soldered in and the tubes all plugged in, it came out looking absolutely absolutely stunning. Now I didn't film uh, soldering up the display board here with the clock delay on it, but I think it came out looking gorgeous as well. Uh, so let's put some power into these and see if they do what they're supposed to do. All right, first things first, uh, like always, let's do a smoke test. Uh, I have genuinely not put any power into these and I very well could have soldered something up wrong or there could very easily be a design fault in here somewhere that's shorting one of the rails. So I wanna make sure that everything comes up correctly. Uh, these 16 tubes are uh, split out into collections of four and the filaments for those are powered off of the main 24 volt rail. So uh, it'll be four, 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 and four. These two over here, the filaments are powered off of the negative 12 volt rail. So if every single tube comes up, that'll tell us that at the very least, we've got our power routed correctly. So let's go ahead and flip the switch here. All 16 of those have come up and it does look like the filament for these two have come up as well, so that's excellent news. Now, I was expecting the VFDs to uh, illuminate as well. I was actually expecting all of them to illuminate. Well, four on the top and four on the bottom, but they don't seem to be illuminating. I don't think the filaments have come on for them, uh, and these resistors should be getting warm, and they're not. So I'm gonna have to look into why those filaments aren't coming up, but everything else seems to have powered up correctly, so, well, that's good news. That's an excellent start, at least. Yep, I had totally forgotten that the uh, filament power for these two VFDs is actually coming off of this header over here. So I just ran a jumper up over to that header up there. So if we flip the power on, check this out. That is all eight of our inputs from our paper tape. Now, because we send the input from the paper tape through an inverter and then buffer it, everything is backwards. But what that means is that the inverters look like they're doing what they're supposed to do. So I think we can start testing this out and uh, make sure that all of our inverter buffers are working. And then we'll put a signal into it and see if the clock is going. All right, to give all the inverter buffers a test, I'm just gonna take a high level input, which I've got on this uh, jumper cable right here, and I'm just gonna swipe it right across the eight input pins here. As the cable makes connection with one of the input pins, that'll be a high level input in, which will uh, pull the inverter low, uh, which should turn off the appropriate VFD over here. And if we touch the very first one, yep, <laughs> That's awesome. We can see that one kicks on and off. So let's just go down the list. They all turn on and off perfectly. That's awesome. Oh, it's the little things in life. That's really cool. <laughs> All right, I've moved over to the new Siglent scope uh, because the HP 150A, apparently I let it sit for too long and it just uh, shut off and won't turn back on again. Um, the power switch seems to do 
absolutely nothing. So, well, that's another project to add to the list. We'll have to figure out what went wrong with it. Don't let your electronics sit too long. Uh, anyways, we've got the uh, new scope set up here, and it is uh, currently reading the uh, square wave coming out of our 12 AU7 over here. So I've got our little test rig uh, that we had earlier set up so that I can steal the square wave off of it. And it's feeding into uh, one of the inputs of our buffer inverters down here. The rest of the inputs for the buffer inverters have to be pulled low in order for this to work. So we've got uh, at least one signal coming in and so that means that uh, our little delay here should be working. So if I turn on trace one here, there we go. We can see our delay and it does seem to be working uh, absolutely perfectly. If I take my uh, little screwdriver here, I can actually adjust this a little bit with this uh, multi-turn potentiometer here. You can see I can make the delay a little bit shorter there and then I can make the delay a little bit longer. And we're at uh, 200 microseconds per division. So that's about 300 microseconds there. Um, interestingly, I can't adjust this one to as big of a delay as I could the test set up here. Uh, I must have something wired up incorrectly or differently, or I don't know, maybe the tubes are behaving strangely. I don't know, I got something strange. Um, but uh, either way, that seems to be like we have a really good delay going on here with good square waves coming out. So I think that's going to work, even though it is working slightly different than our test uh, bench setup up there. With that all working now, I have a new problem. I'm all out of space in the room to just store these boards loose and they're just gonna end up getting broken. So it's time to start mounting them to the backing board. And I'll lay down a template, securing it in place with some painter's tape. Then I'll go through and drill all the holes to mount the PCBs. I'm reusing the backing board from the previous design. So there's already a ton of holes in it, but fortunately none of them seem to overlap. It's a lot of drilling, but with the template, it's pretty easy to hit the right spot. Next I'll work my way around screwing the standoffs into the wood. Because there's so many extra holes from the previous design, I have to use the template to figure out which hole needs to get the standoff, and it's a little tedious, but really it wasn't too bad once I got into the groove of it. Finally, let's start mounting the PCBs, and we're going to start with the input register switches. Then we'll get the address decoding board in place, and we'll follow that up with the diode decoder board. This is one of my favorite boards, by the way. And then we'll put in the inverter buffer board that we cut today, followed by the inverter buffer display board. And I forgot to film it, but I also bolted in the scratch register memory boards. All mounted up and uh, it's actually giving us a pretty good idea of how far along we are on building out the second half of this system. Now it looks like the backboard is very sparsely populated, but you got to keep in mind that this massive section here in the middle is all going to be filled by paper tape. So we have uh, down here, we've got one byte of memory. This is going to be the scratch register. We still have to build the output register that's gonna sit right below it. Uh, right above it, we have all of the address and control for that. And then all the way up here on the top, we have the input register, which is just gonna be some toggle switches as well as a header. Uh, and then we have the uh, paper tape interface that we built today. So we still have to also build a uh, soft start that's gonna sit up here and then all of the buffers and interconnecting pieces that run down the sides. And really that's about it. Uh, once we get all of that built and all of this interconnected, the only thing that's missing is the paper tape. But before we get as far as building the paper tape itself, I do wanna test out that all of this stuff will play nicely with the processor. So after we get everything else filled out, we'll build a new remote control that plugs into this little header right here that'll allow us to single step the entire system, giving it memory addresses and instructions and having a little clock button on it. And then we'll create harnesses that connect this board 
up to this board and it should be pretty much complete from a vacuum tube standpoint. And then we can finally get into figuring out how exactly we're gonna build that paper tape that sits right here in the center. So this project is coming along very nicely at a a pretty good clip. So we're gonna make some pretty epic progress on it before the end of the year. I'm hoping to see real instructions running on this thing soon. So I wanna thank you guys so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next episode.